Ovaj program sadrži plasiranje robe. Dobro večer, dobrodošli. Specijalno izdanje emisije u obruču. Da, niste baš navikli u julu mesecu da nas gledate. Ali posebna je prilika. Ovih dana se u Beogradu održava trenerska klinika koja nosi ime jednog od najvećih trenera svih vremena, Dušana Dude Ivkovića. I u njegovu čast udruženje košarkaških trenera Srbije okupilo zaista jednu jaku grupu trenera predavača. Jedan od naših omiljenih trenera, jedan od omiljenih trenera vašeg komentatora je večera sa nama u studiju. Imat ćete priliku da čujete njegova razmišljanja o košarci, o njegovoj karijeri, o svemu onome što mu se došavala. Karijera je zaista prebogata. Da, krenuo je od Ju Masa, Univerziteta Massachusetts, onda je imao svoju priču i u NBA ligi, a najprepoznatljivije po radu koji je napravio na Univerzitetu Kentucky, sa koga je zaista izbacio ogroman broj velikih NBA zvezda današnjice, tako da će biti zaista veliko zadovoljstvo razgovarati sa gospodinom Johnom Caliparijem. Mr. Calipari, it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight as our guest. I heard you gave my background. Did you let him know I was fired by the Nets? Did you tell him that one? <laughs> no. Okay. no, no. But you, you took Nets but to But I playoffs. was, yeah, you we did. We did. Uh, coach, uh, what was the trigger for you to, to go into, into coaching? Now it's a heck of a career, but I, I imagine all the starts are kind of difficult and you know. I grew up... Um, wanting to be a high school coach and teacher. And the reason was, I grew up, that's who we looked up to. There were no doctors and lawyers. My parents were not college educated. My dad was a baggage handler. My mom worked at the high school cafeteria. Um, so I looked up to teachers and coaches, and that's what I wanted to do. But I went to college, and I said, wow, maybe I'll do this, and then the MBA I looked at that, man, maybe I want to do that. So it, it was a process, but it's not, when I was in seventh grade and eighth grade, and even as a high school player, it was more high school than it was college. Um. You've told us uh, before uh, we started about uh, your uh, first big job at uh, UMass. You told us that uh, nobody wanted that job. Why, is, why was that? Because UMass, uh, there were 300 programs in the NCAA. It ranked 295 out of 300. So it had a losing record, record for the decade, the worst, one of the worst records in the decade before we walked in. So people looked at it and said, don't want it. Um, I was a young coach and it was an opportunity at 28, 29. Wow to become a head coach, and I said, let's go for it. And I wasn't smart enough to know you're not supposed to win there. So you have a different <laughs> mentality of why can't we? You know, if these guys are doing it, why can't we? And I was lucky enough that parents, when I was young, entrusted me with their sons. And so we had good enough players that we could compete, and then we got the Lou Rose and the Marcus Cambys, yeah. and then we went to another level. But when we first got started, it was about survival. How do you get that, Coach? You are famous for a lot of stuff, but your recruitment is like off the charts. How do you make parents trust you, even in, in, in such a young age? Like you said, 28, 29. Well, I, I tell the story of Marcus Camby, and you, you you let them talk first. What what exactly do you want for your son? And then the young man, what are you looking for in a career? Where do you want to take this? What position do you want to play? How do you want to play? And then you go from there, but you're always honest. You're not going to lie to them. You're going to, you know. So Marcus Camby said, I want to be a shooting guard. He was 6'11". <laughs> now, he grew from 6'3" to 6'11 over a year and a half, two years. I want to be a shooting guard. So I was going to be honest with him and I said, okay, 
Now, we do post our shooting guards a lot, just so you know. Um, but to this day, Marcus and I still talk. And as much as he says, I love you and appreciate you, Coach, I'm like, wait a minute, what you did for me in my career, being able to coach you, don't even go there. But, but Coach, it wasn't just Marcus Camby. I told you, I still have that, that game on tape against Allen Iverson in Georgetown. It wasn't just Marcus Camby. It was a lot of good players, two guards from Puerto Rico, Edgar Padilla, Carmelo Travieso, Dante Bright, Dana Dingle, Dana Dingle. Tyrone it, Weeks. It was a great starting five. How did you manage to bring those guys to, to UMass? Back then, kids stayed. Camby yeah. left after three years. Yeah. The others all stayed four years. They're all college graduates. Yeah. It was different back then. Yeah. But you needed that one guy and in my mind, to, to win a national title, you're going to have to have three to four, quote, NBA kind of players. Um, we, in my mind, um, those guys, Edgar Padilla, Carmelo Trevieso, Dana Dingle, Dante Bright, along with Camby and Tyrone Weeks, I mean, they were a team. Um, we may have had Camby, who was the best college player that year, in my mind. Allen Iverson was drafted before him, but we were an unbelievable team and played together. Uh, had the first Latin backcourt to yes. ever get to a Final yes. Four. Maybe there's not been one since. Yes. Um, but everyone, Dana Dingle was like the glue. Dante Bright was a finisher. The two guards spoke Spanish. So they could say things to each other during the game that the other team wouldn't know what they were saying. The problem is I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't know what they were saying. So I had to ask them for – I also had Rigoberto Nunez, who was Dominican. Yeah. Um, I had Goodell's Padilla, Edgar's brother. So there was a lot of Spanish spoken on my team and on the court. <laughs> uh, coach, uh, how much did you have to change your approach during the time? Because – you're a coach for quite a long time, and many things have changed since your beginning and till nowadays. Uh, how did you manage to stay on top, on high level? How, did, how, how often did you have to change your approach, to change your basketball philosophy and everything? That's, that's a great question because I, I was taught this game by Larry Brown. Maybe the best coach to ever coach this game. And let me tell you what he taught me. Two things. If you care about the kids, you authentically care, you'll always have a job. So you could tell the way I coach and how I put players first, how I do this. Second thing was the most curious man I've ever been around. Curious. Always wanted to know. And if you had an idea, it wasn't just the idea. Tell me more. Go deeper. How do you put it in? How does it fit? Were we curious? And I've tried to stay curious. Um, I, I was talking this morning about dribble drive. Yeah. Obviously, if you go basketball, I brought that to college basketball. But it wasn't my idea. Yeah. A junior college coach, yeah. a lower level coach, came to watch m my team practice. And we went to dinner after. And he told me about he showed me on sugar packets. We were moving them around. And I'm like, what? I went to California. Yes. Flew almost as far as it was to get here, to California. <laughs> Didn't get it. He showed it to me in practice. I had to fly back three times because we were into screening and moving and pet. And this was driving and driving and skipping and driving. Yes. And Friends of mine like, what? You're listening to a junior college coach. You're winning 75% of your games and you would change? Well, we changed and I started winning 90% of our games. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everybody's trying to do the same stuff. Now, it's become five years ago, I talked positionless, just being curious, watching. There's no real point guards anymore. Yes. Everybody's a point guard. Yes. There's no real centers. Jokic, shoots, yeah. floaters, and passing, and you know, I mean, so there, it's positionless. You have to know how to play basketball. Yes. Um, it went 20 years ago from size, 10 years ago to athleticism. The king now, skills. Yes. So it gives yes. everybody in the world a chance. A chance. 
So I don't need an excuse. How much time are you spending in the gym? What are you willing to sacrifice yes. to become the most skilled player? How many hours will you go at 4.30 in the morning like Kobe did? Well, I can't get up at 4.30. Kobe did. He went three a days. Yes. So are you willing to take care of your body? Are you willing to eat right? All that comes into you can do this. How do you pass it? How do you dribble it? How do you shoot it? Yeah. Are you quick enough to get the shot off? Can you beat people on the bounce? All of a sudden, the game is now expanding to everybody if you want to be special. Big Boy's not a great athlete now. Jokic is just like he <laughs> runs you like, what? I mean, and he jumps really high. <laughs> and he's the but best he's player yes. in the NBA. Yeah. The most, he dominates just because of his skill. Of course. And let we listen to these great NBA players on TV a lot of times say, well, back in my day, it was tougher, it was something. Now correct us, correct us if you're wrong. But sometimes when I look at those NBA games from 90s, I see a lot of players that today couldn't stay on the floor. Maybe it's my assumption, but some of them, I don't know if they could play skill-wise. Okay, skill -wise. Let, me, let me go back to, there weren't yeah. as many teams, yes. and on every team, to make a team, there were at one point eight teams. Yes. So to make a team, you had to be really good. Yes. And then you were probably playing with other really good players, elite players of their time. Yeah. Um, but physical training has changed. Way back in the day, they'd be smoking a cigarette after the game <laughs> or having beers. The game ended, they had beer. I mean, it was totally, now guys hire chefs. Like the chef travels with them, so they eat every meal right. I mean, it's it's changed, but I would not take away from a Bill Russell, of course, you know, and the players that played back then. Even a Bob Cousy, some of the viewers here would say, course, yeah. Bob yeah. Cousy. Who is Bob Cousy? <laughs> I mean, but there were players that were so elite at their time. Uh, I was with Reggie Jackson. I went to a Yankee game. Yeah, and there was Reggie. I hugged him and I said. Could you still hit these guys? <laughs> and he says, yeah, I couldn't run as fast, but all oh, I could hit them. Like, you know, I mean. <laughs> Even at this age. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, say to our viewers, uh, the coach you were referring to, is, his name is Vance Wahlberg. Yes. And also Denver Nuggets with George Carl were yes. playing the same offense. You implemented that offense, if I'm correct, in Memphis. Yes. And we saw it. Can you? Tell our viewers a little bit what it's about. I mean, you had Derrick Rose, you had Chris Douglas Roberts, you had all those okay, great but, players. But, but, it, but initially I didn't. Of course. So I ran an offense that is more a driving, looking for skip passes than it is screening, passing, passing, screening, which was the Bobby Knight, okay? Yeah. And which all in America ran. That's what we ran to this offense, but you had to have players who were skilled enough to be able to bounce it, to drive it, play through contacts, see skips. So when I put it in, I'm like, I got one guy that can run this on this team. And we ran it for him. He was a walk-on, did not get a scholarship, ended up being drafted by the Memphis Grizzlies, ended up being player of the year in our league. Because we ran this for him. And what it said to me was, if we can run this and get a bunch of players, they're all going to benefit by this. And I had to go out and recruit players, the Chris Douglas, the Antonio Andersons, yes. Robert Dozers, Joey Dorsey, I can go on, Derek Rose, Tyreek uh, uh, Evans. Evans yeah. So I, And then at Kentucky, expanded it to make it a little more random, but... Still the same, six draft picks off of one team, twice. Five first round draft picks, four lottery picks off of one team, three times. The number one pick, the number two pick, everybody benefited, numbers didn't matter. We had a lottery pick score nine points a game. We had a guy that came off the bench 
probably shouldn't have. But off the bench, lottery pick. Devin so, Booker? Devin Booker. Yeah. Who now just yeah. made another $225 million. Yeah. So he's made yeah. $300 million and he's still young. He's going to end up making 500, half a billion dollars. The players from Kentucky have made $3.5 billion <laughs> in we, NBA can contracts. Can you say that again? <laughs> yeah, $3.5 billion. And we're not talking endorsements. We're just yeah, talking Jeff. NBA contracts in my time at Kentucky. But I believe, one, they were talented. They had great parents because they learned to share and be great teammates. You can't come to Kentucky unless you understand you're playing with other good players. It's not going to just be you. You're not going to be the sole guy. But the other thing was teaching them the skills of where the game is. The game in the NBA is random basketball. It's random. They're principles. They're teaching actions. But it's random. You have two or three actions you can run on this. Choose which one is best depending on the defense. How do we create for all you closeouts where your player's under the basket and the ball's thrown over the top and he's got to run out and go guard that guy? That is what you're trying to create on offense. And so how do you play off that closeout? It's random. If they come high, they come low, they come short, they come arms down, it's become random. So I'm... My thought is the way we're teaching, what we're doing, the terminology prepares them. 55 have been drafted. It's a record. 75% of those get to second contracts, which is how you get to 3.5 billion, which will be 5 billion. So if there are any players in Serbia, they should be coming <laughs> to Kentucky. Done. <laughs> What determines the level of success that will player have in the NBA? They're drafted, they're playing in their teams. What determines the level of success they will have? The best players that I've coached, there's two things. One, they're curious. They're always watching and always trying to get better. They're curious. They're not playing video games. They're, they're thinking, but now some of them are good video game players, but they're thinking basketball. The second piece, they have a fight in them because they've not been enabled to think or delusional to think they're the best. They'll fight. They get with other good players and they figure out how to eat. Yeah. There's, there, there's you, you figure out what I've got to do. Um, and I think the other piece becomes, Pat Riley said, my guys in the NBA, Pat Riley's a Kentucky graduate. Yeah. But he said, your guys in the league are all great teammates. Well, all that means is you understand how to share, that you're not, you're comfortable in your skin. You, you, you're not worried that someone else is playing well. Um, but I, I think that's the key to all this. Are you curious? Will you fight? Are you a great teammate? Um, and th there comes a skill level, uh, athleticism, size. If you can are really skilled, because it's the king, and you're really athletic, and you're really big, well, okay, now you're a top 50 in the history of the sport. Yes. But if you're not, if you got size and athleticism and unskilled, where do you play? You're not going to get to a second contract. Yes. You're just not. Uh, you, you said, like, uh, I, I always wondered about that. A lot of coaches here in Europe also uh, tell that story. You mentioned it. You had a bunch of extraordinary players go through your hands. How do you find those guys that are happy if a team wins and he scores, like, five points, eight points? On the other hand, when he scores 25 and the team loses, well, he's happy for himself. How do, you, how do you find those guys that are great players that can be happy when they score three points and the team wins? In, in most cases, it's the families and the parents and the people around them. And I always say this to the guys, why I don't deal with parents, like I'll wave to, I give them, the, I, after a game, I call it the Heisman. You know, hey, how are you? <laughs> you know, I just give them that. But if their son scores 25 and we lose, they're happy. If we win and their, their son scores six, 
They're not happy. So basically, it's not the parents, and they're supposed to be that way. They love their son. They're concerned about their son. I was a father. When I watched my son play, if he wasn't in, I went and got something to eat. I'm like, I don't care. I mean, he's not in the game. Yeah. And if he's in the game, I'm watching. There may have been a couple players I didn't know their names on the team. That kid, number 12. So I get it, but my job is to get with young people who understand if your goal is to be in that NBA, are you going to be the only good player on the team? How good is the 12th man on the team? He's like really good. Really good. So you're going to have to learn to play with other really good players. 98% of the NBA role players. Did you hear what I just said? There's only a few volume shooters. I have 11 of them. But they, <laughs> there's only a few volume shooters. Yes. The rest of them are role players. How does P.J. Tucker at his age get $33 million? For three years. $33 million for three years. Three years at his age, he's going to be 41. Of course. So how? Because he's one of the best role players in the NBA. He's made a career of it. Now I'm telling you most of the NBA, you've got 35 players that are volume shooters in that league, can shoot every ball they want. The rest of them are role players, and they got to fit in. That's what you learn with us. Parents want their son to be one of those 35. The chances of them being one of those Very 35. Slim. Very it's, slim. If that's slim, it's that way. <laughs> Coach, uh, how much did the one and done rule change the college basketball? Uh, you, you, you said it at the beginning. I don't like this rule. It's made for the NBA, not for the NCAA, but I will embrace it and I will try to make the most of it. How much did, it, did, it, uh, did that rule have influence on, on, on college basketball and NCAA nowadays? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it the way you did. It wasn't a rule that I liked, but it's a rule and I'm going to take advantage of it. And then in America, everyone was mad at me. I'm like, it's not my rule. Yeah. So all coaches said they would never do it. And after we did it, and then we won a national title, every coach did it. They're like, well, my thing is if it's good for the players, I'll make it work for us. And it is good for the players. What if a player stays two or three years and gets hurt? Game or over. doesn't yes. play as well, not trained the way needed to be trained, Diet wasn't what it needed to be. He would have been better off being professional. So of the 55 draft picks, probably my guess is 38 of them were with me one year. Not all of them, but 38 of them. Um, if you come to Kentucky, 70% of our players get drafted. Now, when we grew up, it was if you ever become an NBA player, you're, it's amazing. It's a small percentage. It's, it's 70. It's you're Clinton. not getting 70% of our kids get drafted. So um, the way it changed was what do you run that you can teach in a year? My team has changed. I've been at Kentucky now going on my 14th year, yes. which is a long time and it, to be at any one place. But my team has changed every year. So then you say, well, how do you coach? It depends on who I have. How we play, it's good. The principles of balanced scoring, um, rebound margin, you know, the different numbers, the principles of how we play, uh, five guys in double figures. Yeah. So one guy can't average 40 because we're not going to score 130. <laughs> Okay, so you got to have five guys in double figures. The most you score for us is 20, 21. But it changed how I coach. You can't have a lesson plan year to year to year that doesn't change. It's changed every – I have to put in drills that I have to invent. On the fly, basically. What's our issue? All right, how do we cure it? Let's. What about a drill like this? So, But it's made me curious – and it's kept me young because I don't have a choice. I have to keep <laughs> up with this or we die. But like you said, uh, so much amazing players in Kentucky. 
but we were also seen you since we've been doing NCAA games since you took Kentucky 14 years now. Uh, you had those teams at Kentucky, let's say with Harris, Harrison <clears throat> brothers, with, with How about John Wall, Eric yeah. Bledsoe, DeMarcus Cousins, Patrick yeah. Patterson, the, the, my first team. Yes, we remember really. that team that lost to West Virginia. Right? Yeah, they yeah. we shot 0 for 22 yes. from the three. Yeah. And that's one game. If it were best of seven, <laughs> different deal. But one game shot, stuff happens. Um, but I would tell you, even those teams, that team, my first team, yes. John Wall and those, they weren't an execution team. But we would overpower you, speed, athleticism, tough, yeah. fight. Like, but execution of stuff, we were awful. But we were so good, and then we hit a game where we couldn't make a jump shot. But, and that game knocks you out of the but tournament. Like, I was referring to that run you had to the Final Four with Harrison Brothers and... Five and, freshmen. Yes, and nobody was expecting Kentucky, like... That wasn't like some of your top-notch recruiting classes. But well, still, Julius Randle yeah, was on that, James Young. That was a yeah, that better was a team than you think. But, yeah, but you, we start five yeah. freshmen. Willie Cauley-Stein. Yes. I mean, so we start like this and then stop turning it over, take better shot. We five freshmen, five first-year yes. players, and then we went like that. But it took us till late February to yeah. start the climb, and I – I said, boys, we're running out of runway. We got to get there. We're not landing this plane. You got to. And they took off. And uh, Julius and James and I think Dakari Johnson was on that team. Yes, he was. Yes. Um, Aaron so, Harrison turned into Robert Horry in the in the March Madness. Yes, he, he made, it, made game every after game, game winner. winner. Yeah. Uh, if we are going back in the days, uh, we cannot. Uh, we, we have to mention Anthony Davis. You know, uh, he was the guy who went from college to United States national team. He won Olympic gold. After that, he won the world championship with you guys. You won NCAA championship. After that, he won the NBA ring. He literally he's won He's done everything. it all. And he's yeah. not done. Yeah, he's not done. Yeah, he, when I went to recruit him um, in Chicago, south side of Chicago, um, when I went in the home, there were 12 people in the home, grandmothers, un aunts, uncles. And basically, I said, Kentucky's not for everybody. He had grown from 6'3", like Marcus Camby, to 6'10". So he had, he was not recruited his sophomore, even his junior year, he started to be looked at. It was the summer before his senior year. And I basically said, look, I'm not promising you anything that you'll start or what, you know. And, and I can remember he came down to visit, and as I watched him more, I said, this kid's ridiculous. He blocks every ball. He plays like a guard, but he's got size like a big. And the president at the time at Kentucky was Dr. Todd. He sits in with the family as we're practicing and talks to the kid. Now, you understand the kid was skinny like you know, had big shoulders, but everything was skinny. And Dr. Todd says, wow, that was a great family, great young man, and he has to stay here more than one year. I go, no, Dr. Todd, he doesn't <laughs> have to stay here more. And we win a national title, yes. and by the end of the year, it's not close. Now, let me say this. The NCAA championship game against Kansas. Yeah. He is one for six at halftime can't make a shot and tells the team, I can't make a shot. I don't know what's happening, but you guys score it. I'll rebound and defend and do the other stuff. And I know he said it because I was behind him walking in the locker room. He ends up being one for 10 in the national championship game and wins the outstanding player. No one even thought about anybody else. Duran Lamb had 22 in the game. Darius played well. Michael played well. Uh, Marcus Teague played well. But they were not the MVP. He was one for ten. It shows you that it's not just scoring. Can you play? And if you're not scoring, how do you help your team? What do you do? If you really help your team when you don't score, you're Anthony Davis-ish. If you have to score to help your team, and if you're not making shots up, ah, we lose. I mean, are you ever going to be an Anthony Davis type of player? No. How do you... How do you explain a player in this one-and-done era? 
that they have to change their game. We were talking about Carl Anthony Towns, one of the purest shots. I don't know, I don't care if he's big or is he guard, one of the purest shots. He was a, basically a shooting guard in high school. He comes to your program, all of a sudden we are brought doing those games late at night and he's almost exclusively playing on the low post. How do you take a player of that magnitude and tell him, listen, you gotta go down and stay down and I mean, in, in today's game, player can say, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go somewhere else. I asked him if he wanted to be the number one player drafted. And he looked at me like, yeah, okay, let me tell you the things you have to do. You have to play pick and roll defense. Can you guard a guard if you have to, even if it's only three steps? Second thing, can you rebound with two hands? Go get every ball. Can you block shots? your value is going to elevate, okay? Your shooting's not going to be taken away. You'll go to the foul line and you will make shots. But can you do these other things? Because you don't do them right now. I'm going to teach you to do those things. Now, there was a player at that time that everybody said for two years would be the number one pick. Went to another school. No. Aunt Carl Anthony Towns was the number one pick. Now, you know how many minutes he played a game? How many? 21 minutes a game. That's so that Dakari, Dakari Johnson European. could play 19 minutes a game, yeah. who's still playing in China, making big money and doing well. But 21 minutes, he showed he was the number one pick. And yesterday, he also got $225 million <laughs> yeah. more. So, I mean, one came off the bench, one play 21 it's do you have the skill the analytics will talk about your game yes. but he was uh, and you're right when I watched him in high school all he wanted to do was shoot threes I'm like you're 611 <laughs> go inside he went inside he was awful but he uh, we were sitting there and yesterday he he called me because uh, I tease him the cheapest player I've ever been around cheap cheap <laughs> he's in the NBA calling me I want to get my parents a king size bed. Who, who do you, someone, can you get me to get a bed? I'm like, dude, you make enough money. Why are you calling me for a bed? So yesterday I said, I'm looking for a king size bed. That's what I texted him. And he immediately called me, said, I'm broke. I can't do it. I can't do it. Is, is, it, is, it, is it a different game coach at Kentucky? When you come into such a huge program with, I imagine, 20,000 season yeah, tickets, you, it, you, what is it? Yeah, we, every game is sold out. So if, if we go on the road, you'll be watching TV and the team will have 5,000 in their arena the game before. And we walk in, there's 5,000 outside waiting for tickets yeah. the night before. Yeah. And so every game we walk into is someone's Super Bowl. It's, it's, it's the biggest game, which means you're going to face their best either on the road or at home. And if you don't want that, you want it to be cute. You want to play a 2-3 zone. You don't want to be in a fist fight every game. You don't come with us. That's why I said this is not for everybody. And it's not for every coach. Could you imagine coaching every game as a Super Bowl? Is it a tough home crowd, even on you and your players? No, they, they, they've only, they don't, they will cheer. We lost a game to Texas A&M at home. We haven't lost many home games. Last year we won them all. but. We, the game we lost, uh, uh, I decided not to trap a kid from Texas A&M. Obviously, I look back, I should have trapped him. He had 41 points. They beat us. As he walked out of the arena, our fans gave him a standing ovation. They didn't boo him. They didn't throw stuff at him. We have the greatest fans. They're engaged. But if you lose some games, they're also engaged. And they'll, you know, they get angry and they should I understand it but our fans are the greatest now when we go on the road ah and my point to my players guys they've been waiting for this for a year let's ruin their weekend let's just ruin it so they're sick all weekend and uh you know it's it's if you're not up for that you don't go to Kentucky you don't coach at Kentucky you you know it's other places are good programs but this thing is a, it's a different animal Završnica ove emisije koja bi realno mogla da traje i tri sata. Coach, let's talk a little about New Jersey Nets and your time in the NBA. I remember there was 
a lot of talk about you maybe returning to the NBA, but that didn't happen. How was your experience in, 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 in the NBA? Made me a better coach, uh, partly because of what I learned, partly because you get humbled. Like, that is an unforgiving league. Um, I went in, and the motto for, you know, players first was what we did when I was in college, and it was every player a career year every year, which was continuous improvement. Um, we built a new practice facility. And I did something back then is I had a chef come in, and no one was doing this back then, and cook breakfast for the guys if you got there early enough. But you had to be there by nine, so I had Sam Cassell. That's how I got Sam Cassell to get there because the players are cheap too now. <laughs> if they get free breakfast, <laughs> yeah. they're like – and if you got your breakfast and he made whatever you wanted, pancakes, eggs, omelets, whatever you wanted, and then you could order lunch to go. And he put a bag in your locker. Man, dudes were there early. And I also, uh, David Stern at the time stopped me from doing it, but I had all the players picked up in limos to take into the airport. So they would, the limo driver would drive to their house. All they had to do is leave their luggage on the step, the lug, boom, in the car, you get on the plane, on the plane, the luggage, and then the luggage would show up outside your door at the hotel room. And the NBA called me, you can't do that, that's added to salary cap, and David Stern told me I couldn't do it. But I was trying to do stuff to make New Jersey at the time the destination that players want to play because of facilities, because, and I would always say, we may not be able to pay you, but I want somebody to pay you, I'm fine with it. You just help us win. And we went to the playoffs. Yes. Sam Cassell led us, one of the best point guards I've ever coached. But we played Chicago uh, and for two games. We had a chance. We had to had them beat in Chicago. Had them beat. Yes. And he stole the ball. Michael Jordan stole the ball well, from Kendall Gill and dunked. And yes. we fouled, and it changed the game. Um, just a quick story about Michael um, um, Kerry Kittles had 17 in the first quarter on him. And he looks over at me on the bench. And you never looked at Michael Jordan. Because if he looked at you, you were not, I just would look away. Like, I'm not yeah, looking at him, I'm not. He went like that. And I looked away and I said to my assistant, what's he doing? I think he's saying Kerry's not going to get a point. Kerry didn't get a shot off in the second and third period that I took him out in the fourth because I was afraid Michael was going to demoralize him. Now, Kerry was a rookie, yeah. so he was a young player. But those days, you know, Michael would give you a stare. You're like, all right, I'm staring back. <laughs> uh, let, let's do a couple of quick questions, Coach. Who, who, who's, in your opinion, who's the best player you ever had? I know it's a... It, well, you, I, it, it's hard to say. Of I, course. Here, here's yeah. what I've been blessed with. Yeah. My best players have all been great teammates. Sam Cassell was a great teammate. He, he would get people going. I mean, Derrick Rose, unbelievable teammate. Marcus Camby, unbelievable, unselfish, all of them. Um, you have uh, uh, John Wall. You have Anthony Davis, Carl Towns, Devin, all the best guys, unbelievable people, teammates. I've just been blessed that way. And I've left a bunch off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Who, who's the best player in, in the NBA today? Who, who would you pay a ticket to go and see? Well, when Anthony's healthy, yeah. okay, um, I saw him a few years ago in the All-Star game against Giannis, who's really come around to be. But he tried to go in, and, and Anthony's like, no, this is – it was in New Orleans. This is my home. And, but you, you have to look at him. Steph Curry, who, well, how is he that good? Skills. Skills, skills with the ball. How about the skill to fly and get free? That's a skill, too. Like, you don't wait for stuff to happen. You make things happen. Um, I, I always say you can be disruptive or be disrupted. I'd rather be disruptive than, than you get me all out of whack. And part of that is how you play, how you're skilled, how you think the game through. And so you got to 
put him and there's some young players that are coming that I think will be the next wave of the NBA. You, I don't mention LeBron. LeBron, you forget that he's been the best in the league forever. And um, 37 going on 38? Yeah. Probably could play another three years at a high level. Yeah. But again, like Kobe, takes care of his body. Knows his body is his king. Uh, you mentioned some of the players that are cheap. Can you name some that are not? Who's a big spender? I don't know who, who that would be. Um, I mean, for most your guys. Most of the guys, uh, my guys are cheap. But let me just tell you, Carl, I, when I go to the draft, I have before they leave me, I have a money talk. Yeah. The money talk is put your first million dollars away. Forget you have it. So that if something happens, you crash and burn, you can live on $100,000 a year, $150,000. You could live on that if you crash and burn. First million you put away. Um, you don't buy three cars. They depreciate. You know, you just don't do it. You live tight until you get a second contract. Then you do what you want to do. Carl goes, shows up at the draft, and he has this watch on, right? And I'm looking at that watch, and he sees I look at it. He just looks at me and said, Coach, you know what I did? I went to the jeweler and said, let me wear it for a week, and if I like it, I'll buy it. Well, he's getting his back after it's done. <laughs> and, and you had uh, Derrick Rose was cheap. Derrick wasn't cheap, but he had a watch on. It was unbelievable at the draft. And he knows I'm looking at it. He said, Coach, I had to. Come on now. You're looking at my watch. I had to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I just want these kids to never be in a position. Look, I go into home. I told you how I grew up. We called it Friday to Friday. Friday was always payday. Yeah. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you ate pretty good. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday were tough days. Thursdays, you're eating breakfast for dinner. That's your cereal and eggs and stuff for dinner. I, I know what it is. And to live that lifestyle and then have to go back to how we grew up, not good. Not good. Matter of fact, really, really bad. So my concern is always you make sure for the rest of your life and the way you guys are doing it, the rest of your family's life, your family's family's life, and maybe their family's life are good. And I call it like I went from the business of basketball when the one and done started happening. I went from the business of basketball to the business of families and helping families. And you know what? It hadn't changed. It just made my program even better that I'm concerned about the families. I walk in a home and I say, if we do right, it's not going to be like this long. I live this way, so I understand. And the players all know the money talk. I tell them, you don't have just one money guy. You have three. And you have the three look at each other and it yeah. make sure. And I say, because you're not going to have time. And I said, I got three money guys, believe me. And I'm calling them once a week, telling them, all right, tell me what's up. You looking at his stuff, how's he doing? He's looking at him. Because again, my concern is, I've been there, I know where you came from. And let's make it so that no one, it's generational, the change for your family. It's the American dream for a lot of these kids. And it's their only opportunity for their family that's on this path to change, to live the way they can live. Besides you, who's the best college coach? There's a bunch of them. I mean, we had a lot of guys retire. Name, um, name three. Um, well, I always go, you, you know, John Wooden was yeah. the best ever. And you have to talk about Larry Brown. Um, you know, you have guys, the Bobby Knights, uh, the Mike Krzyzewskis. I mean, there are guys. Um, and, and the wave of guys right now, Tommy Izzo and Bill Self and I are, you know, we're all friends. We all know each other. We're all competitive and we want to beat each other's brains in. Um, and there are other guys that have, uh, uh, have done great. I'm leaving guys off. My good friend who was here a few years ago, Rick Barnes, I just think is unbelievable. Bill, uh, Bobby Huggins is going in the Hall of Fame this year. Um, you know, so there are tons of really good basketball coaches. But in the States, our game is changing because now you can transfer without penalty. That would be like in club basketball in Europe. 
You sign a contract as a 12, 13, 14, and you can't leave that club. How about if they could? Then Without died. penalty. Yeah. They just go to what that's what college is. They can transfer now without penalty and play at another team right away. Where before, in, in Europe, somebody got to pay out this contract or you're not yes. leaving or you're not playing anywhere. With us, you had to sit out a year. Yeah. And if you transferred again, you had to sit out another year. The other thing is name, image, and likeness. The players are now able to benefit by signing autographs, by doing ads, doing whatever. So now they, and, and I think it's right, we just have to control it, like it, as in what are the guardrails for us coaches um, so that it doesn't influence transferring, it doesn't influence freshmen where they go. Um, you know, we've never had a level playing field. And, and I just heard Coach Gonzalez from Berlin say, we have the lowest payroll In and we're world. doing fine. Well, that's when I was at UMass. We had the lowest payroll, and we went to a Final Four. When I was at Memphis, we didn't have what Duke and North Carolina and UCLA. Kansas, and, yeah. and So it's never a level playing field, but you want to make sure they're guardrails, and we're not there. It's the wild, wild west right now in college, and everybody's trying to figure stuff out. Well, Coach, as uh, my colleague said, we could easily go on for another three hours or something like that, but uh, our time for this show is up. Uh, it was really great pleasure and unique experience to have this conversation with you. Thank Thanks, you. Coach. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks a lot. Poštovani gledalci televizije Arena Sport, nadam se da ste uživali pa barem deo onoga što smo mi imali zadovoljstvo u ovom razgovoru sa trenerom Kaliparijem. Pre nego što se ova emisija završi, vidjet ćete još jedan reklamni blok i nakon toga prilog koji se tiče trenerske klinike. Također da se još jednom zahvalimo u udruženju košarkaških trenera Srbije, Ivanu Jeremiću, predsednik udruženja i naravno generalnom sekretaru Strahinji Vasiljević koji su omogućili da ovaj veliki trener posjeti našu televiziju i da snimimo ovaj intervju. Uživajte, poštovani gledalci. Kraj je jedne zaista fantastične sezone na kanalima televizije Arena Sport. Uživajte u letu i mi se tamo vidimo negde, verovatno, krajem septembra, početkom oktobera. Ako vas ne iznadimo se još nekim specijalom. Doviđenje. Meridijan, lepa strana života. Srbija predstavlja Premier Ligu na Arena Sportu i svim Telekom Srbija platformama. Meridijan, lepa strana života. Dvadeset prvo izdanje Beogradske košarkaške klinike od ove godine Duša Nivković završeno je početkom jula u dvorani Ranko Žeravica. Kliniku je ove godine posetilo preko 800 domaćih i stranih trenera, a nju je specijalno otvorio ministar omladine i sporta gospodin Vanja Udovičić, koji je ovom prilikom prenao svim trenerima lepu poruku o važnoj ulozi trenera u životu svakog sportiste. Pored izvrsnih predavača koje smo imali ove godine, 
Etore Mesina, Dušan Olimpijević, Izrael Gonzales i naš gost John Kalipari, na košarkaškoj klinici u hali Ranko Žeravica dodeljene su i prestižne nagrade udruženja. Nagrada za životno delo, kao i prvi put ove godine zlatna plaketa za doprinos i razvoj košarke u Srbiji. Takođe, svim trenerima, osvajačima domaćih takmičanja dodeljena su i priznanja za postignute rezultate u protekloj takmičarskoj sezoni. Trenerima je podeljena i jedinstvena knjiga, zbornik omiljenih vežbi čuvenog trenera i filozofija njegove igre, košarkaška filozofija Dušana Ivkovića. U sklopu trenerskog paketa trenerima su podeljene i majice kao i trenerski planer i novo 112. izdanje magazina Trener, u kome se nalaze svi intervjui sa ovogodišnjim predavačima kao i mnoge stručne teme. U ime Udruženja košarkaških trenera Srbije za našu televiziju je govorio predsednik gospodin Ivan Jeremić. Pre svega hvala vam za vreme i za to što govorite za našu televiziju. Došao je početak jula, nova klinika, novi izazovi, mnogo lica koja su bila deo ove klinike u trenerskom smislu. Kako sve to izgleda ove godine? Prvo se zahvalim i vama. Prvi put sa klinike imamo televizijsku ekipu koja koja snima, to je velika čast nama. Što se tiče klinike, klinika je, kao što ste videli, izvanredno ide, predavači vrhunski, dosta trenera, ja mislim da je organizacija na nivou, tako da smo jako zadovoljni i nadamo se da će i naredna predavanja, to je sigurni smo, će i naredna predavanja biti na nivou Mesininog i sada Duleta Olimpijevića. Da, i gospodin Izrael Gonzales i... John Calipari, možemo li nešto i o tome? Stvarno je John Calipari jedna ozbiljna osoba iz sveta NCAA košarci? U ovom trenutku najozbiljnija osoba u NCAA košarci, trener koji ima preko 50 igrača u NBA-u. Velika je stvar što smo doveli njega, a spomenuli ste Izraela Gonzalesa koji je vrhunski trener, svima smo bili na večeri jednoj, i čovjek je rekao otkud ste zvali mene? A procenili smo, gledali smo, pratili smo i videli smo koliko je jedna ekipa ne toliko jaka zadavala problema svim ekipama u Evroligi i što je dobro ispalo, zvali smo ga pre nego što je osvojio titul u Nemačkoj, tako da smo pogodili pravog trenera i sigurno on je učenik Kaita, jednog od najvećih španskih trenera, četiri godine mu bio pomoćnik, a gospodin Aito je bio kod nas predavač već, tako da je praktično nastavljamo tu špansku liniju košaki. Jasno. Da li vas možda i najviše raduje to kakav je odziv što se tiče mladih trenera, naravno i trenera seniorskih ekipa, da li je to uopšte to i najveći ponos koji vi doživljavate kada dođe ovi dan? Pa znate šta, to je kao kad bi doveli najbolje hiruga na svetu, svi bi došli da gledaju kako on radi. Sigurno naši treneri imaju naviku i želju da uče i ima šta da se čuje i da se nauče. Hvala vam puno i puno sreće u daljem radu. Hvala vama. Ovaj program je sadržao plasiranje robe.